we didn't know that we were doing anything different or trend setting or earth shattering. It was a day's work and we really enjoyed it and we enjoyed being with each other. You know, working on the Adams Family, it was a truly uh, a wonderful show to do. I, I used to love to go to work. Not only get paid to do something, but you know, you got to see this work with wonderful people. The cast and the crew made it so wonderful for us kids that we just really had a pretty great time doing it. The first meeting I had about the Adams Family, the idea was that I would play the butler. I would play the character who eventually became named Lurch. I, I left the meeting thinking, you know, this is never going to happen. Uh, later that day, I got a phone call from one of the people who was in the room, a man named David Levy who was the creator of the show. And he said, uh, I have a, a slightly different approach to, uh, to this, and I'd like to talk to you about it. Uh, he said, uh, this is, I don't want you to play the butler. He says, I, uh, I, I want you to play the father. And what this show is, really, is father knows best with different people. What are we going to do? Darling, I must have time to think. After all, this isn't some boyish prank, like setting the house on fire. John Aston was a wonderful guy, uh, very father-like. Uh, I feel as though he was a father-type figure. He always had that type of relationship with him. She so had kids my age. Uh, John was very personable, a very funny man, and um, a warm, very warm human being. You felt comfortable around him. John Aston became like a second father to me, truly. And John and I have remained close over the years, but he was just so wonderful, so funny, so good with us kids, and just a, a, a prince of a man. John Aston was great. I mean, I loved when he used to do the cigar. You know, he, you know, he had his little list of cigar he smoked, and he shoved it stick inside his pocket. And mostly, the, the, the fun was when uh, uh, Carolyn used to say uh, something in French or whatever, and he used to grab his arm, her arm and kiss, you know. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to work with those people, really nice people. C'est la danse. Tish, when you speak French, it really drives me wild. Mon ami. Ah, that's it. Speak some more. Au revoir. Ooh la la. We tested many people uh, for Morticia. And uh, we, we really had trouble finding the right person to play. And then one day, someone came up with the idea of, uh, what about seeing if Carolyn Jones will do it? Now, Carolyn was a, a well-established uh, movie star at, at that time. And uh, they called her up. And when she said yes, we were all thrilled. We were very compatible. and. Uh, um, I loved working with her, and uh, we remained friends uh, as long as she lived. Carolyn was uh, an elegant lady, very much uh, like John, uh, close, warm, but elegant was the word for her. Uh, Carolyn Jones. We were very close. I was in the habit, even though I was only six years old, of calling people by their first name. And my mother reprimanded me and said, you call her Miss Jones, or you call him Mr. Aston. And Carolyn came up with something, and she said, Judy, to my mother, I'll tell you what, let's try this. Lisa, why don't you call me Miss Carolyn, and I'll call you Miss Lisa. So for the two years, that's the way it was. Let me see your hands. Oh, excellent, Pugsley. The nails are nice and clean and sharp. <laughs> and you did very well, too, Wednesday, darling. <laughs> I think we took a pass for nothing. Working with, uh, with uh, Lisa and Kenny, I mean, it was a different thing. Kenny was a lot older than Lisa and, uh, you know, learned his lines and was always ready. You know, the, the kids weren't uh, always there either. I mean, most of the writing went, uh, went around the uh, grown-ups in the show. but. Uh, uh, when Kenny had to, had to perform, he was ready and always delivered. I was excited to get the part, to be working regularly. Uh, I was born into a showbiz family, as you may know. Um, 
everybody in my family's in the business. Uh, my father's side of the family is Lassie's. Uh, my uncle Rudd had uh, Lassie. Uh, my mother's side of the family, my aunt was Ruby Keeler, who was married to Al Jolson. So everybody in my family works. And then, uh, I was about seven years old when I got cast for that show, and I was happy I was going to be working too. Now, uh, what'll it be today, Pugsley? A nice head on collision? Couldn't we have a derailment for a change? A derailment it is. Character development took place on, on the stage with John Astin and um, Charles Adams, of course, worked in conjunction to give Bill the characters, along with David Levy, the producer of the show. They wanted me to play it very straight, very straight, very stiff, um, without much emotion. They didn't want me to show any emotion whatsoever. They always wanted me to keep my eyes wide open. I had a tendency to close my eyes with the bright lights in my face all the time. So they were constantly, keep your eyes open. So all I could see was two big blue dots anytime I was on a camera. Here, I fixed it for you. Actually, it's very handy. <laughs> fixed it? That doll doesn't have a head. It's Marie Antoinette. Grandmama told us about the French Revolution, and Paxley chopped off her head. I was five and a half when I auditioned for this part. The producer, David Levy, told me later on, he said, I was not prepared to see children of your age that didn't know how to read yet. I didn't know how to read yet. But he said what got him was my long hair. So the first thing he asked me to do was pout. Won him over. The pout was very essential to the Wednesday character. Then I still had to do a screen test with, there was I think five or maybe seven, I don't even remember, little girls who had to be on screen with Carolyn and John. And uh, I got the part at five and a half and this, the series started uh, filming right after I turned six. <laughs> Thank you, Sing, but remember, Nobody likes a smart thing. <laughs> the character of Wednesday Adams, as being a little girl, was sometimes difficult for me because she had to be morose. I was never allowed to smile. The pout was the thing. And uh, yet, I worked with these people, John Astin, Carolyn Jones, Jackie Coogan, Ted Cassidy, everybody, who were so funny and so wonderful. And I was just so happy. They'd have to stop if I wasn't pouting, you know, so, and I had to do that for two years, from six till eight years old, so that was a little difficult because she was definitely Wednesday. Wednesday's child is full of woe. That's what was required, so it was interesting. <laughs> Lisa and I, we were about three years apart in, in age, and we didn't get along very much well at all on the set. They had to calm us down. We got along like a typical six and eight year old. Kenny and I had a very difficult time in the beginning. We had certain jealousies. We were like a brother and sister. And of course, we went to school with a teacher from the Board of Education on the set, a tutor from the Board of Ed, when we were filming. And they, at one time, had to put up a partition between us because we would throw pens at each other. We would fight. Our desks faced each other. So they put up a, a wood partition between us because we were just fighting like brothers and sisters. We got along well. And we didn't get along well. And there's a lot of, you know, chasing each other around the set and little wars and so on. Um, but we were very close and we've remained close all this time. <laughs> Cousin Ed was a peculiar character that you brought into the show, and uh, he became the you know the family mascot. Uh, they called me in for an interview, and uh, there was two gentlemen at the, at the on stage, and they look at each other and they say, "Well, that's it." And I said, "What do you mean? <clears throat> what do you mean that's it?" They said, "That's it. I mean, come back Monday, then we start working." <laughs> there actually was two pieces. It was like a skirt type, and then it was a, like a wig on top of my head with a derby head and a pair of sunglasses, and they just brushed down, you know, uh, blended with the brush, and uh, uh, that, that's that's why it. I mean, it was Cousin It. Felix, Cousin It. I loved to be around. 
He was the only one who was a little shorter than myself at six and a half years old. And he was, to me, at that age, at six and a half, the way he interacted with Kenny and I, he was like another playmate. He was sweet, and we're still very close. We've stayed close throughout the years. Cousin It <laughs> was a confusing character, uh, a good source of jokes, a good source of material. You could run with that one forever, of course. Oh, I do hope the new neighbors will like the house. Do you think they will? How can they help it? It is nice and dismal, isn't it? Don't be modest, my dear. It's absolutely bleak. <laughs> Thank you, darling. The set was a beautiful set. And you see all these animals sticking out, you know, the, uh, the fish with the, somebody's leg in the mouth, and uh, the big Kodiak bear standing there, and uh, the plant that uh, Carol and Miss Jones used to cut the feet every day, give them meat or whatever, I don't know what they were doing. It was, it was really uh, dark, but it was beautiful, yeah. Being on that set was something that is out of this world. It, it, you couldn't imagine a more wonderful place for a nine, ten-year-old kid to play who's got a wonderful imagination, and uh, I loved playing on that set. It was wonderful. It was a wonderful stage. It was fantastic. I couldn't compare it to anything else. I must confess, I misjudged you people completely. <laughs> Thank you. I believe that the real charm of the Adams family lies in the strength and the love of the family, the family unit. They, as weird and crazy and macabre as they were, really supported each other as a family. It was one of the first shows that you really ever saw in the 60s, a husband showing that kind of passion and affection for his wife. The, the Tish French thing and when Gomez would go crazy. And even though weird and bizarre as they were, I think people really loved the family, loved the way what they meant to each other and, and how they treated each other and how they supported each other. And then there was, it was so different that it was just fun. You know, <laughs> it's so bizarre, but it was, in a way, very normal because of their relationships. The Adams family was truly a unique family, quite close and loving, nuclear, functional, uh, and different. The humor was on so many different levels, uh, and it was so different from anything that was on television at the time. It was almost shocking to people. Some folks wanted to find something wrong with it, but they couldn't because it was quite innocent, um, well-written, and it was a very close, loving family, normal, functional family. Uh, a little different, a little odd, but that's what made it. And we didn't had no idea that it would be such a cult thing that it turned out to be uh, today. The undercurrent of this show was, in my view, rather uh, profound, actually. Um, He's the smartest ape I ever met. We were, we were different people, but it was OK, because what really counted was what was inside and what we, uh, what we manifested in our relationships with one another. And so the show was, as much as anything, an affirmation of life, an affirmation of respect for humanity. And while its surface was not at all like this, underneath, that's what it was all about. I think it's why the show has continued to have an audience uh, so many years after its inception. <laughs> 